Hello everyone. Once again, we come from Seminole, Florida, our school's hometown, the town that I live in. And today's read was coming from Seminole City Park in Seminole, Florida. I have some little friends behind me, you can see. Now, today's read is chapter 12. It's titled One, and your reading log is reading log 10, which is give a detailed description of Sister Mary Ursula. And then who makes a better counselor? Do you think Rodon makes a better counselor or Ursula by the end of this chapter? If you can't decide between the two, you can add Deming in, though he really hasn't been a much of a counselor yet in our story. Don't forget to make those questions for our author at the, after chapter 10 if you haven't done so already. So, just a little footnote. I love doing the voice of Sister Mary Ursula, but the kids might tend not to if it goes from any of my previous reads. Chapter 12. One. So tying the, the ring to the laces of my bodice, I said goodbye to Feridonia the Knitter and the statue of St. Bruce the Warrior Poet, and I woke up Sir Deming who had fallen asleep on the stream bank, though he claimed he was just thinking with his eyes closed. Are you quite ready yet? He asked as he helped me mount the horse. Maybe we can visit the seashore next, or perhaps you would like to tour the great cathedrals of the Midland Providences. I mean, it isn't as though there's any sort of rush or anything with the old king dead and the new king yet crowned. What had he done, waken on the wrong side of the stream? The new king, I said, doesn't appreciate sarcasm. I could give him the ring and order him to like me, or at least be civil to me and protect me from others' rudeness, but I, sus but I suspected that would be a frivolous waste. Once we had been riding for a long while, he asked, what did you ask for back at the shrine? Oh, I have a new friend coming by. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. You want to join on our read? Yeah, he must have heard you reading. Okay. I had plenty of time to consider what I might answer should he ask the qu that question. Something clever, I calculated, and believable. At the same time, implying that I was not someone to be taken lightly or messed with a deception he might pass on to the royal family so they, they would have a healthy fear of me. But the best I had come up with was, that's for me to know. Sorry. That's for me to know. Deming shrugged and didn't say anything else while the whole ride to the castle. How adorable was that? <laughs> what was that? The dog wanted to listen to my read. Okay, I'm gonna continue. Sorry. Sir Deming once again handed me over to Council Rodon, and I once again decided to forego the bath and change of clothes. After all, if this kingdom included people who dressed like Feridonia, whose fashion sense began and stopped at forest edibles, the royal family would just have to accept my sheep herder's garb. Ah, my royal kin, what can I say? After short intervals of aristocratic abuse, punctuated by my polite little apologies, I'm sorry I smell, I'm sorry I was born, I'm sorry the king liked me better than he liked you, the audience was once again uh, over. Wolfgar, I said to my eldest half-brother, may I please have a word with you? Queen Adriana went off in a huff, sweeping Abbas and Kendrick away with her. I'm guessing, oh, wrong voice. I'm guessing, I told Wolfgar, that I'm going to be needing a lot of help. Yeah, he agreed. Hold on, trying to change the page. I'm thinking it can't have been easy for you as the firstborn, as the do with a domineering mother and two brothers who I suspect have always been ready to betray you to advance their own causes. Wolfgar didn't have to say anything. I could tell I was right by his expression. 
There's nothing I can do about your father passing over. I'm sorry. There's nothing I could do about our father passing you over to name me heir. It'd be a lot easier to just give him the ring and force him to help me than it would be to convince him. But I had to try it this way first in case I needed the ring during the rest of the game. I said, fathers. I tried to get rid of the mental image of me and my ear pressed to the wall, hearing my own father demand, how can I even be sure she's mine? Fathers, I said, can be a big disappointment. Disappointment, Wolfgar snorted. You don't have to be abandoned to be abandoned, I told him. And at that, he looked thoughtful and then nodded. I repeated, there's nothing I can do about our father's decision, but I suspect you would have had competition for the throne, even if I never have been born. Even if Ken's King Cedric had na officially named you his heir. Oh, I can imagine, Wolfgar agreed. If we work together, that's the power divided by two, between two, rather than among four. Wolfgar looked at me appraisingly and then nodded. All right, he said. By then, we had walked out into our courtyard, and I saw that the same old pair of guards dragged the poacher boy towards us. Though he and his king had murdered me once already, I couldn't stand by and let the guards execute him for being hungry. There was no way to start my kingship. Still, I remembered that Wolfgar hadn't reacted well to leniency. What we need to do, I said hurriedly, is to call together a counselor, council of old king's advisors, plus those in the kingdom who know magic. I'll leave the who to you and the what and when. You make the arrangements and I'll just handle this. Wolfgar noted the approaching guards. He obviously dismissed the oncoming situation as within my abilities and turned to go back indoors. One of the guards called out, Prince Wolfgar. Wolfgar gave a vague wave and continued walking away. I stepped in the, into the path of the guard. May I help you? I asked. I'm Princess Janine. I smiled sweetly. The guard bobbed his head in what my, may have been a bow. Princess Janine, this boy has been caught poaching deer. We were about to deliver the usual punishment. Indeed, I said, trying to sound regal. I didn't do nothing, the boy sniveled. I found him dead already. I was dressing him down so the meat wouldn't go bad, but I... You didn't kill him, right? I turned to the guards. Were there witnesses to the actual killing? The two men shuffled their feet. Who? They admitted, and I was sure I saw disappointments in their faces. Then let the boy go. Ooh. Someone else is trying to get it on the read. Then let the boy go, I said. Prince Wolfgar and I discussed this. Well, only if you counted me saying I'll handle this as discussion. But I remembered how the guards had killed me once before because they perceived me as weak. I couldn't very well give the magic ring to the entire barracks to make them love and respect me. The guards smart, sal saluted smartly and released the boy. I will not be so lenient again, I said, which was for everybody's benefit. As though afraid I might change my mind, the boy dashed away across the courtyard, over the drawing bridge and into the woods. The guards walked away, shaking their heads and muttering, which didn't look promising. Surely, I thought, I'm not supposed to let them kill the boy. That couldn't be the right track to take. I was so busy watching the guards, I wasn't aware of anyone approaching. Do you hear the peacocks? Sorry, I got distracted. I was so busy watching the guards, I wasn't aware of anyone approaching until someone laid a hand on my arm. And for once, I locked, locked out, for it was a gentle touch, 
And when I looked up, I saw an old woman. She was about four feet and a half tall by four feet and a half wide. And she was dressed in a simple brown gown decorated with feathers and bits of seashell and smooth polished stones of various colors. I was wondering if she was related to Pharaonia. I asked myself, or was this just the kingdom of, fa of the fashion impaired? The old woman said, blessed is the way of the one. The one what, I asked. All is one, she said cryptically. So I retaliated with a smart mouth and one is all. But the old woman didn't take my comment as sarcastic. That's very profound, she told me. And while I checked her expression to see if she was being sarcastic, she added, I guess you might have been with one. I was going to ask one what, but I suspected we were starting to go in circles again. So instead I asked, are you Sister Mary Ursula? Because I wondered if maybe we were talking about religion. Her face lit up, yes! She was obviously unduly impressed by my perception of perceptiveness when, I w when it was really just a case of got getting a hint from Nigel Rasmussen. You are truly one with the world, aren't you? I surmised that by how you treated that boy, you recognized his oneness. Many would not have. Uh, well, I said vaguely. I took it she was complimenting me, but beyond that, I was kind of a loss. You are the answer to my prayers, she told me, which is the kind of thing I had always fantasized someone saying to me. I just never pictured that someone would be a 70-year-old nun. Um, let's give thanks for our oneness. Okay, you can all roll your eyes now. Sister Mer Ursula said, she clasped my hands, closed her eyes, and hummed nasally. I feel the world in my bones. The wind is in my veins. The spirit of the otter is in my liver. Are you? I mean, you're not. She opened her eyes and looked at me quizzically. I'm guessing you aren't a Roman Catholic nun, I said. I go to Catholic school, so I would know. Like an actress momentarily stepping out of character, she put one hand on her hip and a little chirpy little voice, totally unlike her normal hazy want tone, definitely not, because of course our intent is not to offend anyone. Which was probably a Rasmussen's program idea of a sense of humor. Sister Mary Ursa resumed her slightly foggy manner, said, I am the sisterhood of one. That's a regular order here? I asked. No, I'm the only one. We are all the only one. Of course. How silly of me. She said, I'm afraid King Cedric and his family have not always been quite so one as they might have been. Well, I said, I wasn't sure what to answer, but that made no difference for Sister Mary Ursula had only paused to take a breath. But you are obviously someone who takes oneness seriously. You are a true treasure, like rain on the plain of a drought like a peach without a pit. Sister Mary Ursula patted my hand. You and I are going to get along wonderfully well, I can tell. Shall we unite this kingdom into oneness with the universe? Since she obviously wasn't going to give me a chance to get a word in edgewise, I just smiled at her. But apparently she was through. Come, come. She started, she said, starting for the castle, moving in a slow waddle. 
If the sun is singing in your morrow, tell it to whisper to the acorns instead. We have worked before us. Not knowing what else to do, I followed her. In the castle, we ran into Wolfgar, who was walking with Counselor Rodon. Yes, Rodon was saying. If we send a rider to contact Aldemar, we can use his scrying glass to tell the others, and that will certainly save time with trying to track them all down. Ooh, scrying, Sister Mary Ursula interrupted. She shook her head disapprovingly. As far as I could tell, she was totally obvious, oblivious to the annoying look she was getting from both men. Not a good thing, not a good thing at all. Disrupts the cosmic harmonies, throws off the balance of the one. It's like a fat woman trying to stand on one foot. No, not a good idea at all. She placed her fingertips to her temples and hummed and then shuddered as though a sudden chill. <laughs> good thing we met you in time to stop you. You are not. Stopping us, Wolfgar said. To me, he explained, if you want Oriel and Zenas to attend your meeting, having Aldemar use his scrying glass is the most efficient way to reach him. Well, that made sense to me, but ooh, Sister Mary Ursula said as though Wolfgar had said the one thing she dreaded more than hearing that scrying was about to take place. Wizards, witches, necromancers, they are so strayed from one. You might as well count them as other. No, 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 no. Not a good way to start your work, Princess Janine. Definitely not. No magic? Was that what she was saying? There should be no magic? Surely that can't be right, I said remembering the promos I had seen, which included a wizard and a dragon. Were they only in the dead ends? No magic? What kind of fantasy role-playing game had no magic? But Sister Mary Ursula was shaking her head. Of course I'm right. Right and truth are one with pinnacle and rye bread. Rodon shook his head. I'm going to turn the page. Wolfgar said, Princess Janine, haven't you listened enough to this woman's rantings? As though Wolfgar wasn't standing only about two feet further away from her than I was, Sister Mary Ursula whispered loudly, He's not to be trusted. He was raised by others, you know. To Wolfgar Rodon, she said, Princess Justine and I dance the same rhythms of the cosmos. She has chosen me to be her counselor. And we are now two bodies sharing one mind. Well, that was a scary thought. And anyway, had I chosen her? All I'd done was pardon the poacher boy an action she happened to approve of. Did that make her my official choice of counselor? Princess Janine, Rodon said, are you really planning to dismiss me? I never said anything about dismissing, I started, but Wolfgar, who had been looking from me to Sister Mary Ursula, crossed his arms over his chest and demanded of me, what is she talking about? Sister Mary Ursula answered for me, and I realized I was getting pretty tired of that. She said, the princess showed oneness with the poor peasant boy. Wolfgar homed into what she was talking about. The poacher. You let the poacher off. Is that what she's saying? Didn't you hear my mother's warn you about the peasant unrest? Yes. I said before Sister Mary Ursula can tell me which I thought of this. I thought the unrest would be due to the severity of the laws over minor matters. Minor matters? Wolfgar snarled at me. The laws of the land are minor matters? 
how could every conversation get so far beyond me? I said, well, this particular one was. We glowered at each other until Sister Mary Ursula finally said, see, one mind. You're welcome to each other, Wolfgar said and stormed off down the hall. Rodon threw his hands up in frustration, too. Princess, he started. Sister Mary Ursula put a finger to her temples and said, No, 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 Rodon. And Rodon, too, left in a huff. Can I have two counselors? I called after him. He didn't answer. And Sister Mary Ursula told me, One, one, son, one underlining song of the universe that's the peacocks one best way to prepare eggplant one counselor we must sit down and discuss all that needs to be changed I am a much better person than Rodon counselor Rodon I raised my voice and was pretty sure he could hear me I haven't said no about those magic users coming. I just uh, need to talk to my counselor about it first. And of course, he didn't answer that either. Okay, so write your reading log about um, describing Sister Mary Ursula. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Vivian Van Day Valde, for allowing us to do these reads.